friends and honored guests, colleagues. Thank you for your presence and your presence deeply honors me. And I never even expected this uh, this table, this banquet, this family. Uh, this is the most challenging uh, speech I have prepared. Uh, and I don't know what culminating lecture is. I don't know what defining lecture is, but it defined me in many ways. Uh, but still defining me because um, I didn't want to be too technical, which I would enjoy, but uh, I don't want to be too pedestrian because I didn't want you to go away with the impression that St. Paul faculty is, is every fall. Uh, I didn't want to speak too long. I didn't want to speak too short. <laughs> the best solution to it is quick. <laughs> uh, so I have a five versions. Uh, and I brought two versions. And uh, somehow I picked one. And see what happened. So I told Ashley that the, uh, when I hit the about 30 minutes mark, this will be a sufficient sign for me to, to make it the unfinished symphony. <laughs> okay. Knowing that the, the fame of unfinished symphony of the Schubert, I think that would be sufficient. The purpose of this talk is not to inform you or to teach you or anything, but to provoke, invoke, uh, so that you may continue to think about it. So I'm sure you will finish it better than I would have finished. Even though I gave my title initially a crossing, and the crossing has two meanings initially. It has a crossing as in crossing over, uh, going beyond, an uh, act of transcending. Uh, at the same time, it's a self-negation. Martin Heidegger used to write design and the crossing. So that the, it is supposed to be more than that, more than what is here. So it, it actually <coughs> signing to, to say that the word he is using is not flat. There's much depth to it and uh, he doesn't want to touch it. Uh, so this crossing, um, brings together these two dimensions in direct or indirect way. But my main concern today has to do with a question, what would be or what is the most compelling theological issue today? And that has been on my mind once I decided to retire, disappear. Uh, but the world doesn't seem to be letting me to disappear. <laughs> but today, friends, Christian communities all over the world, but especially in Europe and in North America, are in great disarray, if I may say so. Uncertain about themselves, confused about what they really believe, fragmented among contending ideological groups, demoralized and without much hope and enthusiasm about what they are and what they ought to be, about your sense of mission and identity. They have been on the defensive from the mainstream culture for some time, that has been relentlessly attacking the intellectual content of Christian belief, impugning the integrity of Christian morality, and rejecting Christianity as historically reactionary and humanly oppressive. Christians have been made to feel like pariah, 
an unwanted minority forced either to react fanatical way to assert its identity under attack or to withdraw into impotent inwardness with resignation. And without, to quote 1 Peter 3.15, always being ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Christian communities seem to have lost their spine, their guts, their soul, their spirit. To use a word Jimmy Carter once used, for which he was roundly ridiculed, Christianity today seems to be suffering from a malaise of uncertainty and despair about itself. It is this crisis of Christian identity that I consider the most compelling theological issue today. I heard from various theologians a whole range of compelling issues at various conferences that I attended. To name a few, the returning to the word delivered in the beginning, and is usually patristics comments. Constructing a new theology of the world in the light of globalization and post-secularity, you know who they are, a new pneumatology that speaks to the environmental crisis, <laughs> decolonizing Christianity, liberation of women and nature, a critique of U.S. imperialism, the political role of faith in a pluralistic society, peace and the religious dialogue, so on. I think it is entirely possible to make a case for any one of these issues as the most compelling theological issue today, although they have been around for some time now. Without in any way detracting from the compelling and urgent character of each of these issues, I still prefer to highlight the crisis of Christian identity as the most fundamental theological issue in our world now. For three reasons. First, unless Christians are themselves clear and hopeful about who they are, about their own identity and mission, all these compelling issues will remain only issues with no community to press. Here, it is critical to distinguish between agendas and agents. It is easy enough to talk about things to be done, the agendas, and we often lose sight of the question of who are supposed to do those things, agents. I can enumerate a lot of things related to this. That will make me a bad person. <laughs> As academics, we are more concerned about agendas than about agents. More about what the issues are than about who is supposed to solve them. More about things to be done than about who is to do them. Today, as always, the real problem is more the problem of agency than the problem of agendas. The problem of Christian identity is the most important problem of agency as far as Christian agendas are concerned. In recent years, German philosopher and sociologist Jürgen Habermas has been saying that secular rational morality is too individualistically oriented and provides only a weak motivation that can be provided by good reason. It does not provide either good reasons or good motivation for solidarity as citizens so essential to the legitimacy for collective global practices of solidarity, so demanded 
by the emerging multicultural global society. For such awakening and motivation, one must turn to religious resources in my view. Here, Habermas recognizes the problem of agency, of agents awakened and motivated enough to engage in the practice of civic and global solidarity. In our case, the group to be awakened and motivated is primarily the Christian churches. The primary public of the theologian, in my view, is the church. Even though the theologian may speak also to the general public and the academy. The problem is how to awaken and motivate the churches. It has been noticed with some scandal in recent years that mainland churches have been declining, while conservative groups, evangelicals, Pentecosts, fundamentalists have been growing. However, if these different groups, liberal or conservative, are themselves confused, fragmented, and indifferent without much sense of their missions, and their identity, we fail in the matter of agency in the most fundamental way. Second reason. There are many theologians who raise the social, political, economic, and ecological issues and bring them to the attention of the Christian communities. There are also many theologians who raise the issue about the theology of the church asking what the church is and ought to be, and to do, do so even in the context of multiculturalism and globalization. There are also great scholars who wrote on the history of the church, the history of Christian doctrine, and even plead for a return to the tradition. There are, however, to my knowledge, <coughs> Not many theologians of any stature who write about the state of the Christian communities today as their identity has been severely eroded, impugned, even ridiculed, about the deepening crisis of the very sense of identity of Christianity itself, brought about by the culture that indiscriminately pluralizes relativizes, trivializes, mutilates, and reduces all things to what Kierkegaard once called the aesthetic mode of life. I'm afraid that very few theologians are fully aware of the depth of this crisis now affecting Christianity. We theologians may preach what the churches must do but what if the churches are themselves so intellectually confused and morally enervated by the systematically relativizing and profoundly aesthetizing <coughs> culture in which they live that they have neither definite conviction nor much enthusiasm to commit themselves to anything? The third reason, and this third reason has some substance. In a book titled, A People Adrift, with a subtitle, The Crisis of the Roman Catholic Church in America, published in 2003 by Peter Steinfels, the author provides one of the best, in my view, analysis of the problems facing the Catholic Church in the US in the decades since the Vatican II. And Vatican II, 1962-65. His focus is on the church as an institution. Based on the premise that, quote, the Catholic Church can succeed as an institution while failing as a church. But it cannot succeed as a church while failing as an institution. End of quote. I find this is very irritating and provoking. And so I had a different kind of bar movement with it. <laughs> okay, 
is the rather prevalent dismissal of the institutional church or church as an institution, Steinfeld insists that a people is not a population. People is not a population. A people is not an undifferentiated mass, but a group with a sense of itself, a collective memory, a solidarity, an anticipated destiny, all of which must be preserved in formulas, rituals, written or recited epics, lines of authority, prescribed and proscribed behaviors. And I think about this and to relate that to your vision of church gathering. If I may uh, take a few off remarks and um, today three friends and my esteemed colleague will say something after I, I finish this one. And I didn't give this to them because I'm scared. They, they read this one, they will really do something. Um, but the, um, especially Robert Martin and I have talked <laughs> quite a bit together here and abroad, especially in Korea, and I learned a lot from him. And the, the, the spiritual drama that works underneath is actually taken from, from our work together. I don't know where he is, I cannot see him. Uh, I try to avoid <laughs> Among the problems bedeviling the Catholic Church, according to Steinfels, are simply to list them here. I will <coughs> read this one to see uh, what happened. Polarization between conservatives and liberals with conflicting interpretations of the Vatican II. The clergy sexual abuse scandals. The declining public presence of the Catholic voice and the impasse over abortion. The erosion of the distinctively Catholic identity of hospitals and universities the church operates. A significant decline in Sunday mass attendance and the loss of the sense of the transcendence in the liturgy so essential to the Catholic identity. The problem with the various ways of passing on the faith, such as the survival of Catholic schools, inadequacy of the catechetical education for Catholic students in both Catholic and public schools. He said eight out of every 10 Catholic students are in public schools. The increasing separation between church authorities and theologians. Issues involving sex, gender, sexist, sexist languages, and women's ordination, failure of leadership at all levels, bishops, priests, and lay ministers in dealing with these issues. The diagnosis underlying these problems is the central issue of Catholic identity, which has become rather indeterminate, confused, amorphous, and blurred. He quotes a student he heard, he quotes a statement he heard many times from undergraduates at Notre Dame University and Georgetown University in the 1990s. Quote, I consider myself a Catholic. I like being a Catholic. I'm proud to be a Catholic but I don't really know what being a Catholic means. <laughs> Distant from parish life and church institutions, these young people have little sense of church authority, 
not sufficiently versed in the distinctive symbols, narratives, vocabulary to articulate a coherent Catholic identity, he says. Through no fault of their own, they breathe in a culture of religious individualism <coughs> while no longer tied to the community. If anything, they have generic Christian lifestyle. Steinfels rightly attributes much of this decline in the sense of Catholic identity to the impact of the many and significant cultural changes in American society, such as dramatic changes in family life, the role of women, the rise of other social institutions, the scope of pluralism, and the understanding of tolerance, the nature of information, and the entertainment. Despite denominational differences, I am inclined to think that this description also applies to other community, other communions and denominations to varying degrees. <coughs> and if you read the Robert Butler's book, Christianity in the 21st Century, subtitled Reflections on the Ch Challenges Ahead, published in 1993. The second underlying reason that leads to erosion of Christian identity has to do with the increasing anti-Christian turn of Western intellectual culture and its popularization. For some decades, no human group has been able to remain insulated from the deluge of information, good or bad, or true or false, unleashed by the media and the impact on the faculty of judgment. Sunday preaching, religious education at the parish, Christian schools, these are not the only sources of information regarding what is right and what is wrong, what to believe and what not to believe. Increasingly, the Christian consciousness has been exposed to and saturated by opinions, arguments, ideologies, ideologies, propaganda, and perspectives, some legitimate, others merely tendentious, that diverge from the Christian tradition. What they hear at church one on Sunday is routinely contradicted by the New York Times. <laughs> what they learn in high school religion classes is radically called into question by the Da Vinci Code. What they study in Sunday class or in catechism class is ridiculed by the secular press, television, and on the internet. Secularization of Western culture with its enlightenment prejudice against religion and against Christianity in particular is no longer limited to the intellectuals but has become a widespread popular phenomenon from which the churches can no longer insulate themselves. Christianity has been taking a real battering from contemporary intellectual culture. Science, evolution, genetics, and neuroscience now popularized with all the efficiency, efficiency of information technologies have rendered the traditional doctrine of creation and the soul implausible in addition to rendering the God hypothesis superfluous. Historical investigations into the patristic era have unmasked the violence and patriarchy of the Orthodox churches and discredited the distinction between orthodoxy and heresy. Feminism has been unmasking sexism and patriarchy as something inherent in the entire history of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Critical sociologists and historians have exposed the role of oppression
oppressive power in the churches and radically questioned the innocence and credibility of all ecclesiastical authority. Some of these criticisms come from well-meaning Christian scholars committed to church reform. Some of these attacks come from groups who have a stake in discrediting Christianity. Other criticisms and attacks come from those who want to mix the business of scholarship, if that is scholarship, and the pleasure of making big money by writing best-selling fiction. We must now ask, after all the recent ideological, deconstructive, genealogical, and post-colonial critique of human reason and knowledge, what will still remain of faith, revelation, and redemption? How much of scripture, patristic theological developments, still remain credible and uncontaminated? After all the scientific reduction of concrete human existence to the brain and the genes, how much of human dignity and human transcendence still remain valid? Christian faith is no longer intellectually morally credible. Christianity has been compromised and contaminated beyond retrieval, so it seems. Why take Christianity seriously at all? That's the question I think we have to deal with it in our classes, in our writing, in our prayer, in our conversation. Another sub-theme of this is the globalization of cultural nihilism. This attacks both the ability of the intellect to make judgments and the ability of the will to commit itself. Intellectual attacks on the content of the Christian faith mentioned earlier have definitely contributed to the weakening of the sense of Christian identity. But such attacks are relatively determinate and easily identifiable and they can be responded to through careful scholarship. They can be humbly accepted as true, refuted as false, analyzed as sheer propaganda. There are however other sources that are deeper, indeterminate, and hard to pin down because they operate at the level of sensibility, mood, and horizon. I'm referring here to the culture of nihilism, or nihilism, produced by the internet and the other electronic media during the last two decades. Now, I don't know much about internet. My good friend, Dr. Logan Wright, knows Every time I have a problem, I call him, <laughs> day and night. <laughs> and he, without failure, fixes it. So when I say about the internet, you know, there's some personal, you know, hang on. There are, of course, many positive aspects to the electronic globalization of culture. First, by making all ideas and values available, to all people and exposing them to the critique of all. Cultural globalization, globalization destroys monopolies, hierarchies, and elitism. It is profoundly liberating in that sense. No wonder that the oppressive regimes are always trying to find ways of controlling what is communicated on the internet. This profoundly enlightening also and informative. We academics greatly benefit from it. This benefit calls for a art of editing. The Bishop Kim said a younger son has just published with a new interesting title, Editology. Any ology is good for me. 
<laughs> and editing a the cut and paste is no longer a trivial thing. It is a, one of the important creative acts in which meaning is created and produced. Third, it contributes to intercultural understanding we so need today. The internet has radically expanded the scope of our options and possibilities, greatly contributing to the promotion of the quality of life. The so internet facilitates cultural globalization, which is unifying and reconciling in the long run. But it has its own shadow side. And there are many negative impacts to the globalization of culture carried on by the media. And this is one, the, the, first, the, the following that I mentioned has has a deleterious impact on deepening and intensifying the culture of lies. The internet is perhaps the most potent weapon and site of struggle in competition or in domination. As the, quote, the fundamental symbol processing system of our time, according to Manuel Castellet, book is a must for everyone. Communication Power, published in 2009. The internet provides an arena in which everybody tries to dominate the public square of the internet. Every group, religion, every minority group, ethnic group, political group, ideological group seeks to present certain images of itself and its adversaries to win its legitimacy in the case of world, in the court of world opinion. This struggle happens on the global level. In the process, you know, to win that public square, the following virtue, this is a positive virtue, is embraced. Simplification, exaggeration, Distortion and falsehood are rampant. As our attempts to mobilize all the recent techniques of manipulation and propaganda. In the long run, images and appearances replace realities, ideologies replace truth, bias replaces objectivity, such replacements have become an art and a way of life. When you live this, in this arena too long, nihilism becomes your part. No wonder why Wesley said, all are in need of salvation. Good news is that all can be saved. Are you sure of that? That one is the second part. Thank you for your attention.